Well, uh, let me extend a warm welcome to all of you, in particular to those who are, uh, have now come to Coimbra to uh, be with us in the doctoral programs uh, at SAGE. Um, uh, uh, I would like to greet very warmly Professor Alvar Gariv, the Dean of the Faculty of Economics, and in his person, all his um, collaborators in the governing bodies of the school. It is only natural for us that this inaugural lecture would uh, take place uh, at this hall, at the first School of Economics, since the School of Economics has been, uh, since the start, uh, uh, our most important partner. We are very close associates, we cooperate very closely. Uh, cooperation that is uh, even um, improving its quality and, and extending its scope. Um, uh, so it is, um, uh, the School of Economics is also home to uh, a series of our doctoral programs that were, uh, many of you probably will already have attended classes in this building or will do so. So I would like to thank Professor Arthur Gary, Gary very warmly for his hospitality. But uh, as I said, we feel at home, so it is only natural that uh, this lecture takes place here. Um, I welcome also my colleague Tiago Sanchez Pereira, who will moderate this session. He's been, um, um, uh, and his students um, uh, know this uh, pretty well, he's been uh, um, working for a long time and benefiting from the thoughts and writings of Professor Sheila Chazanov. It's only natural that you'll be the one to introduce our distinguished guest and to uh, moderate uh, the session. And of course, last but absolutely not least, I would like to uh, extend a very, very, very well, warm welcome to Professor Sheila Lazanov. Uh, Lazanov, we are very grateful that she was able to accept this, in this invitation. As a matter of fact, as I heard from her, it is her first trip abroad after COVID. It's not a small step, it's not a, a, an easy decision. Um, but uh, um, uh, we are, we are uh, of course, uh, deeply honored and, and very happy that she could accept our invitation and be here to share her insights and her knowledge with our, um, with our, um, with our students and with uh, the, 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 the larger body of the, of the university. Uh, this is a very happy moment, I think, uh, at least for me as the director of the Center for Social Studies, because uh, um, this is really the first occasion where we gather so many people uh, at a single occasion being physically present. We got uh, used to seeing each other in these small boxes over Zoom or something like that. I believe this is, uh, there is a uh, terrible saturation uh, seeing each other uh, at, this, uh, at a distance. So to be able to come together, of course the necessary precautions having been taken, is really a very happy moment for us uh, and I hope um, uh, um, a very positive <coughs> omen for the student year that is starting right now. This inaugural lecture is a very important occasion in the planning of our year. Uh, it is really the starting point. Um, uh, the ball being kicked off to, to start uh, our labors uh, of the year. Um, uh, many of you are newcomers, as I mentioned pre previously. Uh, I think and I hope that you will be very soon um, um, uh, aggregated to our uh, large community. We uh, spared no effort to make you feel welcome. Please uh, feel free to resort if you have any difficulty to the uh, staff at SESH or, or, and or to the staff at the School of Economics. We are here, we, we're here for you. We are here to ensure not just your academic success, but also that you will later remember your time in Quebra as a, a, a wonderful occasion and as a, a period uh, which you will never forget uh, in your future life. Thank you very much again for being, being here, all of you. Thank you so much, Professor Chazanov, um, for, for being here. 
Um, um, I now uh, give the floor to my distinguished colleague, Professor uh, Alvar Garita, Dean of the School of Economics. Please. Thank you, Antonia. Dear Director of SESH, Professor Sousa Ribeiro, dear Professor Tiago Santos Pereira, dear students and colleagues, uh, dear Professor Sheila Shazanov, you are very, very welcome to feel. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for accepting our invitation. It is an honor to receive you at Philk and hearing from you such an interesting lecture. The uh, Faculdade de Economia, Philk, is a multidisciplinary faculty with uh, a high commitment with criticism, contemporary thinking and social transformation. Today, considering the social and political dilemmas we are facing here in Portugal and I think all over the world, I think it's more important than ever to debate critically the power of science and technology and its social meanings. This issue has tradition at Phil and your lecture could improve its debates. During uh, its 50 years life, Filk built a strong partnership with Centro de Estudos Sociais, mainly on social science, crossing different areas and always looking forward. I think this is the most important. Joined with SESH, we have, uh, at the moment, nine doctoral programs and an academic community with 200 students. Every academic year, the opening lecture of SESH University of Coimbra doctoral programs is a very, very special moment. And I think this year, in this uh, special academic year, post-COVID, I guess, we'll have a superlative moment uh, with um, a multicultural audience. You are very welcome. I'm very grateful to all of you, special to SESH responsibles, Antonio Sousa Ribeiro, Rita Paes, Tiago Santos Pereira, and all of the colleagues, especially to said responsibles, and especially to Professor Schiller Jatanov. You are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alvaro Garrido, uh, and uh, good afternoon to you all. It's, uh, it's, uh, first of all, it's a big pleasure to see uh, such a packed room after being for so long, seeing uh, faces in boxes, and I think uh, uh, this, of course, I think it's, uh, it's also inspiring as an opening lecture for a new academic year. But uh, uh, besides that uh, particular note that I would like to, to leave out, it is also for me a particular pleasure to have here with us Professor Sheila Jasanoff and to have the opportunity to introduce uh, her work to some of you who may not know, but also to have the opportunity to have her with us and know the research that is being developed at SERGE in a very interdisciplinary approach. Uh, in my role here as moderator and uh, uh, introducing this, this uh, lecture, I think I have two main responsibilities. Uh, the first one is to introduce uh, the conferences. And uh, uh, you may know uh, this is a long list uh, of um, uh, titles and experience that I could go through and I'll try to be very brief on that. But firstly, uh, Professor Shil Jasanov is a Torzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies <coughs> at uh, the Kennedy School of Government of the University of Harvard, uh, where she has and she's been directed and, uh, and uh, developed a program in science, technology uh, and society, uh, which has been for long an attraction for uh, uh, young researchers to develop their career in this area. But besides that uh, per, uh, present position, she was previously a uh, professor of science, technology and society uh, at uh, Cornell uh, University, in particular on science policy uh, and law, uh, and where she uh, developed uh, um, one of the first departments, if not the first department, in science and technology studies. I think this is particularly interesting. Uh, uh, today, when we have a, a doctoral uh, inaugural lecture, because I think uh, uh, the opportunity to have here with us today, Professor Sheila Jasanov, in a doctoral inaugural lecture, I think is particularly fitting uh, uh, on two dimensions. On one, it is precisely her contribution uh, to the field, in institutionalizing the field and developing the field, and that means also a second dimension, which is that of de developing careers. Uh, that stem out 
uh, of, um, of science and technology studies approach. And uh, one of the interesting things also is uh, you, you may see in her, um, in her um, trajectory, uh, she was uh, initially uh, trained uh, in, in other areas. She had a, an initial degree in mathematics and later uh, in linguistics, but then she uh, developed a professional life uh, in, in the law from where she moved on to an academic career uh, on law and science and technology and then later to science and technology studies. And I think this is also very appropriate to an interdisciplinary center like SEJ and uh, uh, like uh, Professor Alvaro uh, who mentioned, uh, where we have uh, this mix of different uh, uh, doctoral programs. A second dimension that I would like to, to leave uh, to mention is also on uh, my personal uh, connection with the work of Professor Sheila Jasanov. Um, when I was in your position as a doctoral uh, student, uh, uh, at some point I had this, uh, not exactly my bed, bedtime book, but certainly on the, the top of my desk, the Handbook of Science and Technology Studies, from which uh, Professor Jasanov was one uh, of, um, of the co-editors, and which remained uh, as a central um, uh, guide uh, to, to my reflections at the time in terms of the doctoral and of the doctoral work. And I think uh, uh, if you read, or for, for those of you who've read uh, some uh, of her work, uh, you see uh, that uh, there is a dimension of inspiration that comes uh, from those texts that is more broadly to a wider public, but I also had the personal experience later to spend some time uh, under supervision of Professor Jasanov uh, uh, at Harvard for a short visiting period where I was able also to, to make the transfer between the texts and the person and I think when I've mentioned that uh, 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 her contribution in terms of institu institutionalizing the field and developing a community uh, I think this was particularly important for younger researchers as I was at the time and which uh, I uh, was particularly happy in benefiting and uh, I think uh, helped me later on also in making some choices and uh, uh, opening up some venues and seeing eventually some new doors that I hadn't uh, fully discovered. Uh, in addition, let me just uh, also highlight uh, uh, some other points uh, in her trajectory. Uh, uh, Professor Jasanov has received uh, uh, honorary doctorates from the universities of Liège and Trent has received uh, uh, Alfred Hirschman Prize uh, from the Social Science Research Council. I think this is particularly relevant uh, in the School uh, of Economics and has also recently uh, been uh, elected uh, for the American Association for the Advancement of Science and for the American Philosophical Society, which are very distinguished uh, societies uh, in, uh, um, in academia, in particular in the United States, of course, but, uh, but more generally, more broadly, as international uh, societies. And uh, uh, leaving those points of, uh, of the description of the work, I, of course, I do invite you uh, to also uh, discover some more of, of the work. And uh, just as a final note, just to mention that uh, uh, although there is this field which uh, may not be known, fully known to all of you, which is the, uh, the field of science and technology studies, where science and technology is the object of study uh, from a critical social sciences perspective, but in some of her work you'll be able to find uh, um, many concepts which uh, uh, she has developed and which, with which many of us have worked with, that span across several of the programs uh, 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 in the uh, uh, Center for Social Studies doctoral programs and um, issues like um, uh, discussions of public reason. There is a very interesting collection of essays on science and public reason. Uh, issues that are, of course, currently uh, of, have been of particular relevance to all of us during uh, the last uh, one and a half year of the pandemic. Uh, we've all became experts in what was happening around us. And uh, one of the, the central uh, topics of concern uh, of her work and one of her seminal books, um, The Fifth Branch, studied the role of experts in policy making and the links between science and policy. There are institutionalized pro processes during the pandemic. We've seen this in the open, in the open public sphere, the relation between science and policy and the tensions precisely in managing that boundary. And, and let me just 
have uh, two other two other mentions. One, uh, there are some some of the students who come from uh, uh, legal areas and were studying issues like human rights. Um, we all are, of course, but some have a particular topic in terms of the of the doctorate and uh, a, a recent book on framing rights and the impacts of uh, uh, genetic technologies um, in our news, our, our different understanding of how uh, rights uh, are constituted in the genetic world. Uh, and just to mention also that uh, uh, not just the analysis of science and policy, but also an interest in having an impact in public policy, which I think it's also somehow a trademark of Professor Jasanoff's work and one of the outcomes of uh, her interest um, in the development of genetic technologies uh, uh, is reflected, for example, in a new initiative, uh, collective initiative that um, uh, has been developed uh, on a global observatory uh, of um, a genome editing, which is a, 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 a rapidly developing technology with clear implications in how uh, we do see issues around uh, citizenship. Um, and uh, uh, I, I did not mention, I mentioned the, the pandemic, but uh, Professor Jasanov has been, uh, uh, as co-led with, with a colleague, Stephen Hillgardner, uh, uh, a large international comparative study uh, uh, on the responses to the COVID uh, pandemic. You'll find that uh, a synthesis report of work that's still standing out from that project, a project that involves, I believe, 16 other countries uh, in comparative terms, and that is very insightful in terms of the way that um, uh, the analysis addresses and reflects upon how governments uh, uh, responded and recognized both the impact in terms of the social order, but also in tandem with the impacts in terms of the natural and biological order. And this is, to finalize, a central uh, idea that comes out of, uh, of Professor Jasmanov's work, which is this idea about co-production. It is not about science and technology on one side and society on the other, but I think uh, a, a very simple synthesis uh, of her work is that it, uh, it uh, illustrates how science, technology and society are co-produced. And uh, I think we are here to listen to our lecture, which would be the title we have uh, here available, After Disenchantment, Science, Education and La Vita Activa. So I'm very pleased to welcome Sheila here, here in Coimbra, and we look very much forward to your uh, conference. Thank you very much. Let me begin by echoing the mutual thanks and gratitude, except that I think I'm the one who should be saying thank you and everybody else should be thanked. So first of all to Sage and its leadership for inviting me to come on this very significant occasion in all of our lives, yours because you're starting on an adventure, many of you. Uh, ours because of what, uh, what Professor Tiago Santa has already said, that we're coming out of a period of hibernation in effect and meeting each other at least with half of our faces um, for the first time in a very long time. And so it is uh, the movement back from two dimensions to three dimensions. I mean, how many of us thought that we would be living science fiction lives changing dimensionality you know, in this way, but here we are and we get a sense of what the fourth dimension might look like because we've just rediscovered the third. Um, so thank you also to uh, Dean Alvaro Garedo uh, for inviting me to be in this uh, company and in this building of yours, and thank you above all Tiago Santa Pereira for what feels like a lifetime of friendship and, and collaboration and support. And above all, to all of you, I'm immensely grateful for your being here and for being uh, what uh, obviously is a particularly adventurous group of students because you're all engaged, not in strictly disciplinary activity, but in some kind of crossing of disciplinary boundaries. So you already know where the excitement is, and it's in what is not being charted, what is not fully mapped and understood, but in between those territories. Um, 
And people keep asking me, are you optimistic or pessimistic? And somehow they don't like the answer, you know, somewhere in between. I mean, they really want to know, are you pessimistic or optimistic? So I decided that maybe we should begin with pessimism and move the trajectory of the conversation toward optimism, because I want to leave you on this very auspicious occasion with a sense that forward movement is possible and that you all have lifetimes to dedicate to making that better future that we all crave and hope for. Um, I am from a very secular tradition, but not all members of my family were. And in Hindu ritual and, and practice, auspicious occasions are very common. I mean, you know, so it's not like 40 days of Lent and you give up this or that. It's more that you celebrate these occasions. And so the <coughs> idea that a celebratory moment should be about celebration is you know, something that I've grown up with. Right, but in the Western tradition, there is a respectable uh, history of people thinking of technology and technological change as something to be profoundly pessimistic about. And I want to begin with an acknowledgement of this and that we are not, um, we can't overlook that, 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 that is, there is reason to be concerned in some sense. So I began where social sciences often begin. I mean, it's one of the anchor points with Max Weber. Um, because in a sense, his multiple writings and seminal writings are a place to begin a kind of story of pessimism that characterized much of the 20th century, particularly in European thought. And, you know, to books and, or essays and concepts of Weber's have a lot to do with how we think about the world. One is the idea of disenchantment that comes from his essay on sciences of vocation. It's an apt moment for us to be thinking about it because it's about 100 years ago that that lecture appeared in print. And the other is this idea of the iron cage of rationality and reason. So between disenchantment and the iron cage, there's a lot of negativity there. Um, the um, quotation about disenchantment, um, it's advancing. Yeah, the fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world, a phrase that he was quoting himself. Um, precisely the ultimate and most sublime values have retreated from public life, either into the transcendental realm of mystic life or into the brotherliness of direct and personal human relations. It's not accidental that our greatest art is intimate and not monumental. It's interesting that he's writing before the fascist period, so it's not, not monumental, but as you look up the hill in the university, you see some monumental signs, so monumentality hadn't gone away. Um, but then he says that it's only within the smallest and intimate circles, in personal human, human situations, in pianissimo, so very softly, extremely softly, that something is pulsating that corresponds to the prophetic pneuma which in former times swept through the great communities like a firebrand welding them together. So this is about you know, some sort of disappearance of a communal sensibility and you know, the reason I picked that uh, image on my title slide is that I think it's not accidental that um, Faber wrote those lines at about the same time that um, uh, Rilke's poem, The Panther, had appeared. And, you know, it's interesting to read that text side by side with Faber. Um, so, you know, it doesn't capture the German, but Stephen Mitchell is one of the better English translators of Rilke. Um, his vision from the constantly passing bars has grown so weary that it cannot hold anything else. But that last stanza of that short poem uh, seems to echo something of the same sensibility as the Weber quote that I read to you. Only at times the curtain of the pupils lifts quietly 
an image enters in, rushes down through the tense, arrested mu muscles, plunges into the heart, and is gone. So it's similar to the something pulsating like that corresponds to the prophetic pneuma and you know some latent sensibility that's there to be awakened and yet is submerged in the cage and in the arrested motions. So, you know, to Faber and Rilke, one might add this other figure, one of the few female political theorists of the mid-century, Hannah Arendt, who was also much taken with the sort of negative vision of the ways in which technology was interacting with people's possibilities as political agents and as capable of building the kind of communal sensibility that Weber says is lost through disenchantment and the iron cage. So Arendt too talks about a narrowing of the horizons and she explicitly references Weber, one of the most persistent trends, she said, in the human condition, her great work, um, in modern philosophy has been an exclusive concern with the self as distinguished from the soul or person or man in general, an attempt to reduce all experiences with the world as well as with other human beings to experiences between man and himself. The greatness of Max Weber, she says, in his discovery about the origins of capitalism, lay precisely in his demonstration that an enormous, strictly mundane activity is possible without any care for or enjoyment of the world, whatever. Uh, so that mundane activity is economic activity, the activity of capitalism, the daily practices of capitalism. And in a way, he was foretelling the sort of disciplinary history of economics, at least as it has taken root in America, because it has come completely detached from the kinds of associations that in this school you have not detached. So one of the developments that's happened in my lifetime, for instance, is that the history of economic thought is no longer taught in economics departments. So how the field of economics which you could say is about the strictly mundane activity, happens, it happens without much care for or enjoyment of the world. Uh, one of the Nobel Prize winning ventures in economics recently has been about randomized clinical trials and experimental economics. But the ways in which that very trajectory within economic thought reduces the world to being experimental subjects that phenomenon is not studied within economics. You just do it and you get the results and you look at the interventions and you look at the outcomes and the outputs and it's very quantitative, it's very scientific, it's experimental, it borrows the discourse of science. But where people have gone to in that phenomenon is left to somebody else to think about. So you can have history departments that are to some extent doing history of economics although it's not the most popular field in history. And to some degree, those people have gone to business schools, strange to say, and not within the arts and sciences faculties that are thinking about what it means to have this thing that Weber was talking about, the disenchanted study of the mundane life of capitalism that does not take human beings into account and their soul or their total persona or what have you is just not part of the equation. Now, why has that happened? And you could look at it in two ways that are both tied up with technology. One that Arendt considers in detail, but so have other scholars, including STS scholars. One has to do with the measurability and the mapping and creating of the earth itself as an object of study since the third quarter, of, uh, sorry, since the last quarter of the 20th century. So that is about the emergence of this space, the planet of the earth, which today we associate with a lot of the things that many of you may be studying. So we associate the emergence of the planet 
as an object of study, as a scalar domain of trying to understand society and the social sciences with the human missions to the moon that brought us back this picture of the Earth as a self-enclosed system. But equally, if you look at environmentalism and you think about climate change and you think about global sustainability, these are ideas that have changed the geographical scale and the temporal scale at which we understand problems. They have been bumped up to the planetary level, whereas previously they used to be much more local. So environmentalism in mid-20th century America got started around a slogan that is called NIMBY. Uh, have any of you heard that slogan, N-I-M-B-Y? So it means not in my backyard, and my backyard is about the closest to me, you know, me the self, as it could be. Um, whereas now we can't afford to say not in my backyard because my backyard is linked to other people's backyards and so we have global sustainability as a problem. But this came about, according to Arendt and other people, through its own history, first of all. I mean, so there was in there a history of conquest, uh, of Cold War hostilities and um, above all the military industrial project that brought people to the moon in America it was a, very much a product of the Cold War sensibility of the Kennedy era that got realized in the LBJ, the Lyndon Johnson period that came after a 10 year project to land people on the moon. And even though Neil Armstrong made that comment, you know, one small step for a man, one large step, one giant step for mankind, um, you know, this was being said while the American flag was being planted on the moon. So there's a kind of contradiction between the symbolic politics and the stated rhetorical politics of that moment and what it means for our kind. But it did give, among other things, an enormous boost to science and technology. I mean, so the moon landings were a pinnacle point for so-called dual-use technologies technologies that can be used in peace, but can also be used in war. And some of the dual-use technologies are about mapping and monitoring the Earth and rendering it accountable and measurable in various ways. So, um, we can go back to what people said in those early days. Um, Barbara Ward, a British uh, politician and uh, to some extent, uh, social theorist and her own right and practical person, one of the few people who commented already in the mid-1960s on the change of consciousness that the uh, satellite, uh, sorry, that the uh, space missions brought about, one of the few people who talked about it as a problem for both East and West of the Cold War divide. Americans were busy celebrating the American achievements and victoriousness, to some degree the Soviet Union was celebrating its own Sputnik moment, you know, the COVID vaccine is called Sputnik too. I mean, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's a, uh, for those of you who study memory, I mean, there's a sort of commemoration of these grand moments, you know, repeated at other moments of technological triumph. But Barbara Ward said that at this uh, moment when the astronauts spin through more than a dozen sunrises and sunsets in a single day and night, it is inconceivable that no modification of consciousness or imagination occurs. So if you move away the double negative, it means we must conceive that a profound change in imagination and consciousness occurs. And then if we look at surrounding policy documents, we find that indeed there is uptake very soon one of the formal moments of that uptake is in the so-called Brundtland Report, which those of you who are doing work on environment and sustainability will know very well. Uh, this is our common future. And it begins, in the middle of the 20th century, we saw our planet from space for the first time. At Harvard University, there's a statue of John Harvard and it's popularly known as the Statue of the Three Lies. 
because it's said to be a statue of John Harvard, and it isn't, and it gives the date of the founding of the university, and it isn't, and you know, it gives some other fact that isn't. Um, it was, in fact, some very beautiful young man who was taken to be you know, emblematic of John Harvard. But anyway, that sentence could be called a sentence of multiple lies, because what does in the middle of the 20th century mean? People were imagining the planet from space for much hundreds of years <coughs> before that. Uh, sometimes when I talk about this, I describe a particular cosmological atlas by uh, a, a cartographer, a celestial cartographer named Solarius, who shows uh, in the contrast between the Ptolemaic and the Coper Copernican systems, images that are completely reminiscent of the satellite images. So he was seeing the Earth from space long before the 20th century. Then what is this thing about we? Who is the we who are seeing this? And if it's all of us, then we know from science studies that it is not the case that somebody takes a photograph and then we all see it just like that. You need to be taught the language, the discourse. How do we see something in a certain way? And do we see it from space or do we see it from somewhere? What does seeing mean anyway? Is it a matter of the eyes or is it a matter of other instrumentation? So this is the period when large-scale computer programming becomes possible and it becomes possible to aggregate data. It's the birth of today's era of information technology, datafication, the data sciences. So the reduction of previously knowable tangible, visible phenomena that we could find in our backyard has now been mathematized, rendered impersonal, driven up to scales, and aggregated across temporal periods that previously were not tangible at all. So even this 1987 seminal work, Our Common Future, instantly calls upon us to problematize the hour the common, and possibly the future, because you don't know what time period is involved here. This is all pretty important to keep in mind as we embark upon 2022, which will be 50 years after the first Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment, so it's half a century of thinking in these kinds of terms, and we have to remember the Brundtland Report as doing one of those things that Hannah Arendt was unhappy about, detaching people from place, from action, from the capacity to be political agents. It was rendering the human condition into this impersonal, uh, unattached, ungrounded phenomenon where politics was to some extent hard to imagine. And then we can talk about other forms of rhetoric around this. So this is from Carl Sagan, who, the late Carl Sagan, who was an immensely uh, influential um, uh, astronomer and also a public intellectual, and had this television show that millions of people watched. And he was doing this sort of typical scientific act of saying that the subtext here is the world should see the world as we see it, not the way you all happen to see it. So we are too small and our statecraft too feeble to be seen by a spacecraft between the Earth and the Moon. Well, many of you in this audience are familiar with Bruno Latour and actor network theory and the idea that we should think about objects as having agency. So this passage of Carl Sagan uh, which I'm sure he had not read the essay, We Have Never Been Modern, of Bruno Latour, but nevertheless he is ascribing to the spacecraft the capacity to see our statecraft and to declare it meaningless. I consider this not a moment of inviting objects to be with us in the same parliament, but rather an Arendtian displacement of the human condition by the machine condition. And to me, it is therefore not a celebratory move at all. It's uh, trying to, you know, shunt us aside in favor of some other vision. And interestingly, the most interesting sort of um, 
critique the smallest, shortest, most effective critique of this vision that I have ever seen is in the pages of our common future. When that report was being put together, the Brundtland Commission went around the world and they held hearings. Just like you were told, you know, if you're going to design an environmental project, you should go and talk to the localities and involve them. And they selected some of the quotations from these hearings that they held, and they're interspersed as little boxes in that report. Um, so I like this one, which I hope has immediate appeal to a number of members in this audience, because it was spoken by a Brazilian speaker, not identified, from the Amazon. And again, the very first sentence speaks multitudes. You talk very little about life, he says, the speaker says, I don't know if it's a he or a she. You talk too much about survival. And then it is very important to remember that when the possibilities for life are over, the possibilities for survival start. But isn't this an Arendtian moment, and to some degree also perhaps a Foucauldian moment? There are peoples here in Brazil, especially in the Amazon region, who still live and these people that still live don't want to reach down to the level of survival. I mean, I just think it's an absolutely beautiful, critical commentary that draws together some of the same pessimism that you see in the lineage from Weber to Arendt and the scientific triumphalism that you see in the Apollo missions and the uptake by people like Sagan, and in today's global modeling systems. Um, but it's calling attention to the fact that there are real human lives, communities, and that it could actually be not progress, but reaching down that a survival from a human standpoint is on a lower plane than living, than life itself. And it's that move of the disciplining and what it does to meaning that I think is something that you know, we should reflect on as we think about the social sciences and what they have to achieve, looking forward and looking to the future in the face of the challenges that confront us. So that's one set of moves, the making things so big that the little is lost, aggregating things so much that the individual is lost. Uh, dissolving the ties that made communal action possible, blowing them apart so that the politics is lost and the spacecraft sees that our politics don't matter. Well, I mean, you know, that is not the world's most happy place to be in. But there's another set of developments that to some degree makes us worry about the public sphere. And this is this inward turning of the human onto the care of the self alone that Weber talked about, that Arendt talked about, and that many other philosophers of technology have talked about, including my MIT colleague Sherry Turkle, who has done a lot of studies of um, children as they play with computers and talked about the sort of psychic effects in dissolving. Uh, it, so computers become the second self and part of the exchange of the self with the second self is dissolving other sorts of ties and the loneliness that then grips uh, contemporary societies. And, you know, we have many images of this. Uh, yesterday at dinner we were talking about uh, uh, somebody's uh, father who ended up disciplining a grandchild for bringing the cell phone to the table because the grandfather thought that we still live in an era where our closest connections are the family sitting around the table, whereas the kids know that our closest connections are everywhere except the people that we're with, you know, at that moment. And, you know, you can go to a playground and the parents are not looking at the kids, they're talking on their cell phones or whatever. I mean, it used to be that if you saw somebody coming down the street at you, talking to themselves, you, you know, crossed because this was a crazy person. But now you look at their earbuds and figure out, no, they're not crazy, they're just 
not in this community at the moment, they're somewhere else, right? I mean, so all of us now have second alter egos that are traveling the earth somewhere where we are not. And, you know, a figure of some relevance um, spoke about this um, um, a short while ago, Pope Francis um, was telling his constituents uh, put away your cell phones, and he did this in a somewhat poignant way. The priest says, lift up your hearts, but for hearts you have to have this thing called soul that Hannah Arendt says we don't have anymore. Uh, he does not say lift up your cell phones to take pictures, Pope Francis said. It's a bad thing, and I tell you that it gives me so much sadness when I celebrate here in the Piazza or Basilica, and I see so many raised cell phones, not just at the faithful, even of some priests and even bishops. <laughs> I have to tell you, I won't show you this picture, but I did shape Pope Francis's hand, and I cherish the image. <laughs> but, uh, and we were allowed to take pictures of him coming into the room. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's all uh, modulated, you know, where is the theory and where is the practice. But at the very, at the very least, here is one of, and Pope Francis has emerged as one of the most powerful critics of the same kinds of phenomena that Weber was decrying, and somebody who has spoken about climate change and spoken against the predominance of economics as our sole way of understanding what's involved in climate change and so on. So, you know, it's not irrelevant what he says or what the Catholic Church has to say about these issues. So, Obviously, how we interpret it, how we factor it into our own critical sensibilities is one thing. But I hope that you will not do what once happened, what somebody did to me. I gave a talk in which I was talking about Pope Francis's commentaries on sustainability. And a person, a very um, earnest young political scientist came up to me after my talk and said, are you trying to say that Pope Francis belongs in the public sphere? <laughs> you know, there's the saying we have in English, but uh, if it walks like a dog, duck and quacks like a duck, you know, it is a duck. I mean, so, but by the Rawlsian definition, John Rawls's definition of who should be in the public sphere, religion is not in the public sphere, and so obviously Pope Francis was an interloper in any talk that was about the public sphere. But I would submit that that is a pretty uh, impoverished way of understanding the public sphere. And part of the challenge that we had before us is how to get out of these impoverished ways of understanding the public sphere to become, again, political agents and actors. And so I now turn to the sort of more optimistic uh, side of my of my talk. So one of the things that we've been learning in our comparative COVID project that Tiago was kind enough to mention is that what has disappeared is a sort of widely shared idea of what the social contract is. I mean, this is a doctrine that goes back to Rousseau, goes back to Locke, whether it's theorized in the same way or not, it's at the bottom of democratic social orders. And yet we find that one of the persistent things that has not happened is that social theorists have not kept up with the role of science and technology in influencing the public sphere and how we act and behave as citizens in that public sphere. So, you know, I won't go through each of these bullets, but Wherever we look today, if we want to discover the space for public action, for citizens to take action, we would have to look at um, you know, how um, science and technology affect our lives. I mean, without some theory of science and technology uh, influencing the ways in which we think about the public sphere, we do not have much of a basis for thinking about things like citizenship. And we have to get beyond thinking that well, citizenship is about access to voting machines so that people can vote remotely. I mean, it's not about that. It's about the transformation in identity, the transformation in our affiliations and so forth that um, 
we are all living with daily. And this is where my uh, thinking about uh, imaginaries comes into play. So one of the ways in which we constitute ourselves as collectives is by thinking about the future together. And increasingly, we think about those futures in connection with developments in science and technology. So this is a definition that's in that book, Dreamscapes of Modernity. We define sociotechnical imaginaries as collectively held, institutionally stabilized, and publicly performed visions of desirable futures, equally fear of undesirable futures, of course, animated by shared understandings of, that are attainable through and supportive of advances in science and technology. So that's a lot of words, but it means how do we think about science and technology as instruments, as enablers, as deterrents to the kinds of futures that we want to live in the world. So let me run through a couple of different ways in which people have thought about science, technology, and the human future, and suggest that we are in a kind of, if you want to borrow internet talk, in a 4.0 type of world. So we've been thinking about these issues for a very long time, and you could think about Imagine Futures 1.0 as being largely about utopias and dystopias, and you can look at science fiction for some of the works that refer to this. I mean, so this famous work by, looking backward by Edward Bellamy from uh, the late 1880s was imagining how life would look a hundred years hence. So he was writing a futuristic novel, and there are many features of that world that to some degree have come about. So for instance, he was thinking about credit cards and about the human-less economy already back in the late 19th century. But a thing that I like as representing a completely different dystopic vision, uh, so you can call Bellamy utopic, but Forbidden Planet, from which the movie of which that other picture is taken, Forbidden Planet is about a story of a computer-wielding uh, scientific community that was trying to build something like what the singularity is trying to do, a more potent human brain. Only, so this is Freudian thinking, still in the mid-century, the film dates from 1956, and they have forgotten that in amplifying the human, they would amplify the evil features of the human as well. So the id became amplified, amplified through the computerization and destroyed this community. And so today when you look at misinformation campaigns and so on, you know, I think this is the forbidden planet uh, because when Facebook was introduced, I mean, I think Zuckerberg really did not have it in his imagination to think that people with bad instincts would form communities, as well as people with good instincts. I mean, this was, how could they forget about that? Well, he was only 19 when he got going, so, you know, let that be a lesson to you. Um, okay, so Imagine Futures 2.0 is very determinist, and you can cite a lot of books here that basically say that developments in technology drive the future, and in SDS, we don't think that either. Uh, so we can go to Imagine Futures 3.0. And there you can say that what technology is doing is amplifying humanity's potential for good or for ill. I mean, so this is the Star Wars vision that whatever was previously done on an earthly scale today can be done on a cosmological scale, and it's just the scale that's being bumped up. But supposing we don't always look at what technology does in relation to us and our future. Um, you know, there's this rhetorical move that John F. Kennedy made in his inaugural speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So ask not what technology can do for you, but ask what you can do to technology. So if you, oops, if you turn the mirror around, then you discover that it's not technology that makes the future. It's <coughs> us. I mean, so you can have the same car that's either involved in Uber and is a self-driving car, or you can have it burned out in a California wildfire. And it's not that the car itself 
is incorporating a particular image of the future. And therefore, it's always incumbent on us to ask what kinds of societies are we trying to become with technology. It's what do we want. And there one has to be careful. And again, I will not pause on the particular elements. But if somebody's interested, you could write to me, and I'm happy to share slides these particular slides, but these are well known in the technology studies literature. There's a conventional wisdom, which is the left-hand column. Technology is the neutral thing. It shapes society. Harmful consequences are always unintended, and they follow in the pipeline. They come afterwards. Technology uh, you know, is necessary because we need the technological fix. So if you're in the environment, we need geoengineering because we have to solve this problem. Climate change is barreling down the tracks. We need something to stop it. And the critics of technology will come back and say some of these other things. So, so technology has embedded values. Society shapes technology, and so on and so forth. And technological innovation creates winners and losers. It's not neutral. It's not just that there is a linear story of progress. So you can take any technology of your choice and ask the question, um, not we can now engineer the human race. That is a determinist view of technology from the title page of the magazine, MIT Tech Review. But instead, you can ask, what sorts of people would we become if we chose to engineer the human race? Which is a very different question, and one that I think demands a lot more reflection and ethical thinking from all of us. Um, I've already said that the we in many of these texts is profoundly problematic. And once you turn your gaze onto the future, what sorts of societies do we want to become? The question is, who gets to imagine the future? And I think that that's a particularly opportune time to be raising that, because to some degree in the climate space, we are in the middle of a new children's crusade. Um, you know, a bunch of people who have a very different idea of the normativity of climate, propounding a different way for leaders of the world to think about it. So if you put a Nobel Prize winning economist, William Nordhaus, side by side with a child named Greta Thunberg, um, Nordhaus, a number of years ago, in 2007, uh, spoke out against the Nicholas Stern report. This is where economics meets social science meets SDS. And he basically accused Stern of using numbers that were not empirical enough. And hence, as he said, the prescriptive approach where discount rates should conform to an ethical ideal that this is a bad thing because it becomes philosophy and not economics. So he was drawing a boundary between economic thought and ethics. Whereas Greta Thunberg says, you all come to us young people for hope, how dare you? You have stolen my dreams. So it's like those two discourses don't belong together. And economics that says, if you talk about stealing dreams, you know, you're bordering on the philosophical, the metaphysical, and you don't belong here. Right, so I want to um, round off by saying that, that you know, we um, need to go back to those famous philosophers of democracy and rethink you know, what kind of societies are we trying to build, and rethink what the social compact should look like in the 20th century. And for that, I think we need to put expertise back into the foundational Question. So we all know that this 2,500 years of Western philosophy that deals with the question, what, why should a small number of people govern a large number of people? But today, we equally have to put side by side with that question, uh, the question, why should a small number of people know what's right for a large number of people? Why should the few be empowered to know for the many? And I think that a political theory of the future has to integrate, has to marry those questions 
and think about them together. So if you do that, then in effect, you create parallel constitutionalisms. There's the obvious explicit constitutionalism that we in democratic societies, and even in non-democratic societies are familiar with, who is exercising the power, by what means, is it authorized, etc., etc. But then there's the question side by side of epistemic delegation, uh, which is much more implicit. Uh, how are these same you know, theories of power operating in relation to knowledge and knowability? Tiago mentioned one of my early books, which was about science advisors. And although I did not think theoretically in the same terms that I do now, it, the book is, what, uh, 1995, so it's uh, respectably old at this point. Uh, but nevertheless, I was asking these same questions. How do, what is it that authorizes science advisors to know for us? And then I'll conclude by saying a few words about COVID and how it has affected my thinking and my research. Um, if there's time for Q&A or whatever, I'm not quite sure what the, uh, what the time limits are, Tiago. But we've been doing this study that you mentioned, the 16-country comparison. It's obvious that America is an outlier in many respects, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. But one respect is that we have created a system of public health sovereignty without acknowledging it. So we don't acknowledge that we have created this biological citizen that Foucault wrote about very extensively. Um, and we've handed over rights to the public health enterprise to know us and our bodies and what's right and good for us without asking questions about public reason and authorization and so forth. But it's not a universal we in America. There's approximately 50% of the population that totally rejects this version of public health sovereignty and says, no, sorry, it's this other vision of federalism that ought to prevail. And much of the contestation you see in America is really about how deep or wide or far-reaching should public health sovereignty be, which then leads us to say that one of the great gaps in constitutional thinking today is about the constitutional role of science and expertise. I mean, how does it come about that in several states of the European Union, you have very different approaches to constituting the scientific advisory committees? So an Emmanuel Macron, who comes into power as not being a member of a party, also creates a completely novel, self-standing expert advisory committee on the basis of what authorization precisely is a question. Whereas you go across the border to Germany, and Germany is relying on these long-tested expert bodies that have been doing epidemiology and other things for a long time, and even their ethics body is, gets a prize for, or gets a, an award for having helped build German consensus around COVID policies very different ideas, and then, you know, you can go to Britain or Portugal, and so forth. I think I will quickly go over the, I mean, I'll sort of skip over the next slide, because one can ask about democratic forums and deliberation, and where should people be debating these sorts of issues, and I think each one is open to critique, but let me just leave that to the side and move more immediately to the Lenin question, if you will, and the, what is to be done. And I think, and I hope I've given you a sense, that there is a great deal to be done. There's a great deal to be done in scholarship, but there's also a great deal to be done by way of action. So one of the things I'm suggesting through this whole second part of my talk is that if we accept the fatalism of disenchantment and the iron cage, we will be stuck in disenchantment of the iron cage. But instead, we should understand how that sense of the iron cage is constructed. And then, I think, we figure out ways of breaking those barriers. Uh, after all, that's what the liberationist movements, the great liberationist movements have always done. They have not taken the iron cages for granted. They have figured out how to bend the bars. And then you can rethink the possibilities of the world. So instead of thinking of the world as 
deterministically constrained by the sciences of the moment, we can say, no, sorry, my soul is not going to be taken from me just because somebody has invented a drone or a computer or whatever. That, you know, the freedom of thought is still there and is still open. And then you can act to open up other opportunities. So there I'm taking the Vita Activa and saying that all of you have the capacity to, first of all, integrate across disciplines, which you're all doing through your choices of study programs. But you can also question very long fixed boundaries such as between lay and expert, I'm sure many of you are working with things, concepts like post-colonial knowledge or, or citizen science or indigenous knowledge or things like that. And if you're doing that, you're already questioning some of these boundaries, such as between lay and expertise, have the courage to cross those disciplinary lines in order to imagine alternative futures and then demand and design both of those things, new pathways into the future. So those things, I think, follow from the analytic moves that STS has been making. And with that, let me thank you for your attention and for listening.